Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you to the LLS for asking me to come and speak. I'm hoping at the end of the half an hour or so that I've got that they don't regret it, but I can't guarantee that. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Australian and International Blue E Society, which is just me, so I can speak <laughs> without uh, having to be too diplomatic or be too careful in um, the worry of ruining the brand, I guess. Um, so <clears throat> I'm a seed stock producer. I come from Cower in central west New South Wales. 23 years ago, we started up a composite um, crossing two breeds together, Shorthorn and Angus. We chose those two because of the value of meat quality. Um, at that particular time, we didn't feel like any of the traditional European breeds had enough uh, meat quality in them to bring in. We've changed that recently. Um, they've improved a lot, so we're starting to bring some other genetics into our composite. Um, so basically, it's a 50 Shorthorn, 50 Angus line of females that we've got now. We're bringing in some Simmental and Simmental Cross uh, genetics to um, open it up a bit more. Um, right from the very beginning, we started recording the intakes of all our young bulls. We built a facility on our farm that enabled us to record the intakes, hence get feed efficiency information and start selecting for that trait um, over time. So my position is as a seed stock producer, and I'm going to look at um, the role that data plays in the industry from a seed stock um, um, producer's point of view. I'll try and do what a lot of seed stock producers don't do and respect commercial producers and include you in the conversation as we go along. Um, I think that the main thing that we need to um, understand is that, that intersection where data meets from the seed stock producer to the commercial producer. A lot of the time here it is in a bull sale. So um, what is data? It's a unit, of, a unit of information, often numeric, collected through observation. So there's a lot of things that can be in that, and I will talk about commercial producers as well as seed stock producers in this sense, because a unit of information is whether a cow calves or not, whether she gets in calf or not. It's a leg angle, it's an intake figure, it's a um, doing ability figure or a, a fat score. It's, there are so many different pieces of data. We've heard about lots of data, um, today in relation to finance and in relation to climate and in relation to soils. We're just talking about cattle and genetics of cattle really, but so much of that is um, in the background of what seed stock producers and what, uh, what commercial producers do and probably what seed stock producers should be doing as well. Um, so not always genetic, any piece of information that you can that you can then start to add to your thought processes and what you do in your business will be a positive thing. So if you're taking the number of cows that get in calf and as a percentage of overall this year and then do it again next year and next year, you'll, you'll track your performance. If you're doing the number of calves born, number of calves weaned, year after year after year, you'll start to track your own performance. It's really important to do that. If you can somehow when you buy a bull, put him with a group of cows and track the performance of those calves, which we understand is really hard to do, um, you'll start to build a picture of whether you've been making the right decisions. So I see data through the eyes of a commercial producer. I think it's imperative that seed stock producers collect data that directly relates to the profitability of commercial producers. Research has been done a lot over time, what those are and how they rank. Now you can argue about the placings of all of these things if you like, but these five things sit up the top there all the time. The number one driver of profitability in commercial production is fertility. We know that. There's lots of factors that influence them. Some of them are genetic, some of them are management. So fertility and longevity of the females, I'm just going to put up there as number one. Number two, growth, feed efficiency, muscle yield, and then marbling and eating quality. You can change those orders around if you like, in, and they would change across breed and across producers, but they're the ones. So that's the, 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 the goggles that I look through when I'm taking data within my herd. So let's just quickly rush through those because we don't have a lot of time. A whole lot of stuff in there in fertility. I don't want to confuse you, but there is a lot. But most of those things are that, that the person who's managing the cattle needs to be aware of 
to try and get the best possible outcome. So if the best possible outcome is to hand over genetics to a commercial producer that you ensure will give them the best possible fertility, then you're doing your job. And what I'm talking about today is what seed stock producers should be doing as their job. So whether you're selling a yearling bull or a, a two-year-old bull, whether you're selling fat bulls that have been fed up to sale, um, they're all data that commercial producers should be looking at across breeders and making a decision on where they go. Um, also, you know, what information is provided? The data is, is, is there in catalogues, if you read the catalogues, to find out how they look after their cattle, what they do. Again, some of those figures that are collected end up in EBVs or EPDs um, to allow you to make a, a genetic decision. But there's a lot there. I wish we had time to go through a lot of those things there. But what percentage of your females are crossbred is going to affect your fertility? They're all pieces of information that you can record and then look at if you change them over time. Um, just when we're talking about fertility, it's a, it's a confusing one sometimes because we do have a big difference between the north and the south. As a seed stock producer, I sometimes grapple with this part saying, I've got to put all this emphasis on on fertility, because it's the biggest profit driver. Um, when most of, our, like we're getting and our clients are getting in southern environments, if they're doing everything else right, like we talked about before, getting 90% in the heifers and 95% in the cows. Do we need, like if we're already there, do we need to worry about it? So we put it in the context of saying up in Queensland, they're gains that they, they've got to try and make. They're changes they've got to try and make to build the profitability of a herd. In our sense down it's here, if you don't do it, this is the potential losses that you will experience. So we can't just leave it alone. We actually have to constantly, because the heritability of fertility is so low, just means that seed stock producers and commercial producers have to concentrate on it 10 to 20 times more to make a difference. So it's very important. We go on to the, the we basically collect all those or should be collecting all of those figures, mature weight, condition score, all of those things are becoming very important. We don't have time to go through all of that. We'll have a bit of a touch on it later on. Um, so seed stock producers, uh, feed efficiency. You might be surprised that that one's up there. I don't know whether you are. 10% change in feed efficiency can affect profitability by 40 to 50% is the statistics that aren't made up by me, come from all around the world. So that's our facility. We've got the gross safe feeders recording the daily intakes there. Um, we've just put those covers up to ensure that we're creating a, a, a um, a good animal welfare environment, as well as trying to take some of the external factors out that seem to be um, influencing our ability to look at the genetics of the animal. So um, I know there's lots of controversy about feed efficiency and whether it's being, whether we're selecting for the right thing that's happening out in the paddock. Again, we don't have time to do that today. Um, feed efficiency in relation to whether in the feedlot or out in grass, What's happening with feed efficiency with mature cows? I have so many questions to answer. Um, in the seed stock industry, whether we test for this trait has totally been driven by the cost. So seed stock producers have been deciding not to because it's going to cost them too much. The only people who can change it in the industry is the seed stock industry. Commercial producers can't go and select for feed efficiency. The people who supply you bulls and cows are the only ones who can change the feed efficiency of your herd, which is puts the seed stock producers in a fairly responsible position and powerful position, but they choose not to because it costs them too much. My suggestion is that seed stock producers have been doing quite well over the last couple of years. Good on them, fantastic, that's their job, doing it well. But the argument about not being able to afford to is starting to slip away pretty strongly, if it's a big profit driver for commercial producers. We also measure muscle and yield, um, obviously um, in lots of different forms. We go on to uh, the meat quality stuff that we know, that we know is so important. Um, finding those places as a seed stock producer that you can identify the animals that are superior so you provide a better product for your clients. That's what it's all about. We can go into an equ equation here. We don't have time for this and I'm not gonna bore you with it, but there is, there's an equation for how a seed stock producer should shift the genetics in a positive or negative direction uh, to benefit their clients. It's all about those four factors. So we're talking about accuracy of selection, which is basically just talking about are they using EBVs to make a selection? And we get into a space here where we're talking about do you just look at an animal or do you measure it? 
That's all about the accuracy of selection. We know if you just look at it and make a decision, it will not be as accurate as if you've measured the progeny, measured the parents, the brothers, the sisters of that animal to get an indication of what's in the testicles of that bull that you're going to receive that's going to influence your profitability. Lots of other things there to do with accuracy of selection. Selection intensity. Which animals do you choose as a seed stock producer or a commercial producer to make a difference? If you're just doing a bit of a, I'm just looking at it and seeing, selection intensity is about the animals that you're choosing in the next generation, how different are they to the average of your herd? So that's where AI and embryo work and all that sort of stuff is, is powered by. If I can choose animals that are a lot better than my average, I've got more chance of shifting the average within my herd. Um, uh, genetic, uh, genetic variation, of course. If you've got a whole group of animals that are exactly the same, then trying to shift the average within the herd is really, really hard. So remembering in the space that you know what you've got if you've got a whole group of animals that look the same, you've got a whole group of animals that look the same. That's all you've got. Are they different for marbling? Are they different for, you know, are they the same for marbling? Are they the same for yield? Are they the same for feed efficiency? All of those, if you're not measuring them, it's damn easy to create a group of animals that are exactly the same or, you know, good consistent line of cattle. Beautiful. Jesus, I've done a good job. No. Nah. Um, genetic uh, generation interval is another one. Shorter, shorter generation interval, basically, generation interval is just what's the average age of your bulls and the average age of your cows will tell you um, whether you can shift that, or not tell you with you, are you, if, if the average age of your bulls is five and the average age of your cows is five, um, if the average age of your bulls was three, you'll be reducing your generation interval. It's about the ability to change over. Best described probably um, the generation interval of a chook is really short. The generation of an elephant is really long. So we struggle to compete against those industries because we don't have a shorter generation interval. There's a whole lot of other reasons. But we don't have a short generation interval to be able to turn over to get the next generation to make the changes to genetics. Um, so data, 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 what's the power? It's the power of the data that we're, I've been asked to talk about today and what shift can it make in our industry, in our herds, in our profitability. So to make a genetic change within your herd to supply a better product to commercial producers which enables them to be more profitable. That's the job of a seed stock producer. The job of a seed stock producer is to know that equation before. I'm sorry if they don't know that equation and they don't understand it, they shouldn't be doing it. Because it's the way that you, it's your responsibility is to shift the average of your population so your commercial producer has shifted his average so he makes more money. So again, we say that to the commercial producer, to make a decision when you're selecting your animals, whether it be in the yards at home in replacement heifers, be making logical um, data-based decisions, just looking at and so I'm going to keep the big ones, maybe, maybe that's not good enough. It's really, really hard to do, but the more information you can put into that decision, the better it'll be. But we're more talking about when you get to bull sales and use the catalogue, use the information, ensure you've been provided with the best information. Uh, the power of the seed stock industry. Here we go. Um, 33 breeds in Australia. I think that is just the most extraordinarily strange thing that we've done right across the world is, is, is focus large numbers of people into groups of animals that have just got the same hair follicle colour on the outside of them. That's, that's what we do, not just in Australia, right around the world. In Australia, 33 of these groups all sitting there in their own little worlds thinking they're doing the best job and trying to convince everybody else that they can. Um, what a watering down of the power and information and all of that sort of stuff that could come from a powerful industry all working together. But nope, we're all in it. My black ones are better than your white ones, which are better than the black ones that have got the white around the belly, which are better than the red ones, which are red and white, and, but they can also be... I don't understand it. It's quite strange. It's completely illogical to profit, but we do it. So um, those breed societies managing the data managing the pedigree, that's their job. I'm wondering 
in time can that change? Will genomics allow us to get out of that breathe society lock and say any commercial producer could come along, do some DNA on his animals, say, here are my superior animals, I'm going to breed from them, do you want to buy a bull from me? Maybe. I don't know. But if all we've got to do is manage the data and manage the pedigree, we don't necessarily need a breed society to do that. Any organisation, a much smaller organisation that doesn't cost so much, um, could do that sort of stuff. Not taking away from the power and the wonderful things that breed societies can do. And the Angus breed is the greatest example of that. And good on them and what a fantastic job they've done for their members. That's bloody fantastic. Has it been the best thing for the industry as a whole? Don't know. Um, when we talk about all of these changes being made within industry and, and within breed societies and things, never is the data the problem, it's always the people. So you take the data, you put it into an EBV, you take the EBV, you put it into an index, you take the index and you give it to the breed. Whatever goes wrong there is never the data's fault. It's probably not even the equation's fault, although people do make decisions on the indexes. You know, you see the indexes at the end of the EBV spread that was designed for commercial producers to make it easier for them, being bastardised by the breed societies, or the seed stock industry, should I say. But the decision that's made on the weightings is a human decision and, and should be based around, and we've got Brad here who will talk to you later on, who knows the power that he has and the responsibility that he has in making those right decisions as far as... You know, is this, is this a, a financial decision? Is this a decision about where we want the breed to go to? It's really, really hard. It's a really, really hard job. But we need to respect it and that that, that decision is being made. How the breed or breeders use the indexes mm -hmm. is a, completely a, a people thing. And nothing more clear than what's happened with the Angus breed in the last three or four months where they were challenged with a shift in the breed through their indexes, a shift in the way the breed, they saw problems, been talking about the problems for a very, very long time. They made a shift and the breeders didn't like it and they told them, nah. So just remember this one as you're working around in uh, looking at cattle breeders, looking at figures. You can always find an animal that proves an equation or data to be wrong. You just have to ignore the other 99% that proves that it's right. Yep. This bull shifted and no, he was really good, whatever. Um, so, God, I'm so pissed off. I've got so much to say. Um, just a little bit on the showing part. All I want to say about the showing part is how ridiculous to have it on the same screen as um, achieving maximum productivity with minimum waste, effort and expense. The show game is a joke. It is a disgrace to this industry that we still do it, that people encourage it. The Land Newspaper, the RAS, still encourage this stupid, stupid, archaic thing to be done, and people are supposedly paying attention to it. There is, the most important thing to understand, there is nothing about the client in showing cattle. It's done entirely for the seed stock producer, for him to promote his product and show it off and make himself feel good and be able to go to the pub that night and get pissed. That's great. But, and, and, and I loved doing that too, but it's got nothing to do with production, it's got nothing to do with the responsibility of a seed stock producer. Um, what happened then? Oh. Uh, I don't know how much too much time I've got. I wanted to talk about three major things that I've seen happen within the industry over the last 50 years, probably. The first one was when they changed the sale yard system over from per head basis to a cents per kilogram basis. That's when data started in our industry in a really, really strong way, because you had to weigh it to sell it. Or like you, had, you send it into the sale yard, they weighed it, and then told you what it was and how much money you got. That drove us to start looking at production and efficiencies and that sort of stuff, which was a fantastic thing. Um, the next one would be the value of meat quality. We'd, talked before about the, the wonderful work that MLA and the Ag Department and that sort of stuff. That was groundbreaking stuff that happened then. It was absolutely amazing, but it came from data. Data, a massive research project that was based on just shoving a piece of meat in front of a student saying, do you like it? 
and then they went way, way back right through everything before that and worked out what changed that eating experience. Brilliant stuff. To me, you're going to have to give me 10 more minutes, I'm afraid. Oh. The, the most important thing, I think, is in, in the next phase is methane output of our animals and our breeding systems and how much we can sequester or retain. I talk about climate change in the sense of what I do as a seed stock producer, as a farmer, I respect research, I respect the data, I respect the information. So in doing that, when it comes to climate change, all I can do is transfer that over and go, I have to respect the data, I have to respect the researchers and the information they're producing and how arrogant of me to think for this one little part, if it doesn't suit me, that I won't listen to those scientists. So I choose to because I respect science, I respect the processes and the people that do it. Um, so, so climate change in the beef industry. The most, I don't have a lot of time. The most important thing that we need to understand is the two ways that climate change is going to affect the beef industry. One is what we talked about before. How's it going to change your farms? How's it going to change what you do, the species you need to have, the way you go about your day-to-day -day life? That's, that's one form, the weather affecting how we are working on our farms. The beef industry is different to anyone else in agriculture. 70% of the emissions come from red meat. We are, we are not like a little bit out there, we're massively out there compared to all the other food products. All the other food products. The, the, the pressure on us and the focus on us is enormous. A large percentage of that is from cattle, not so much from sheep. Think about this, when a sheep producer or a sheep company comes forward and says, buy my low emissions red meat, it's right there. It's lamb compared to beef. Do you think they're not going to do it because we're mates and we go to the pub together or we're I don't know, part of the same industry? Of course not, let alone the rest of the protein supply. Um, four major things that I think we can do in... Oh, sorry, back to the, the, two, the two things. The second thing that we have to worry about in relation to climate change is how consumers are going to change their behaviour. What you think out there doesn't matter. Nobody gives a rats. All they matter, or, or the only part you can play is, are you going to eat meat tomorrow? We don't care whether you think climate change is real or what you're going to do about it or not. It all depends on what the consumers out there. And what we need to understand is they do not give a rat's ass about us. And nor should they. Nor should they. Because it's just another food. It's just another food. We love our industry. We love beef. We absolutely adore what we do. Them out there, they don't care and don't expect them. Oh, if we have a better conversation with them, they'll like us more and then they'll come with us. What? <laughs> There's so much I need to do, but we can't. From this point of view, <laughs> There's so, little, so much we could have talked about. Um, in a practical sense, I talk about all this stuff. I think that the, the four major things that we need to do is, is talk about soils, is talk about genetics is talk about management and is talk, talk about diet. Can I just talk one quickly part about the diet part? Changing the diet of animals so they don't produce as much methane. We've talked a lot about this asparagopsis, the thing. Asparagopsis, which you've got to feed to the animal to get it into their stomach. To break. So 4% of animals in Australia are in feedlots, usually for a third of the year. So we're spending millions, of, it's a great thing. It's, it's another thing that we need to do. But just remember that that, it's a third of the year for 4% of the animals in Australia. What are we doing about the rest of them? We have to find the biggest, biggest emitter is the cows. We all know in our own beef production systems, 70% of the feed goes down the cow's throat. When you think about emissions, you don't go, Here's an animal, he's 18 months of old, I'm about to cut his head off. This is the amount of methane that he's produced throughout his life. Uh -uh. You've got to chuck the mum's 12 months of methane on top of that. The cow's emissions have got to be accounted for. So if we say 70% of the emissions are being produced by the cow, then that's the place we've got to go to. But we're not. But we're not. I don't know in anything that I hear talked about, uh, is there anything that's talking about 
how we're going to reduce that 70%. The other stuff we can, we can fluff around with all we like. But unless we do that part, we're not going to make a change. And, and my part in what I do and my approach in all of this, which I think is really, really important in the way that we think about it, the number one thing I want to do is fix climate change. Not save the beef industry, fix climate change. If we do that, if we do that, we'll be doing the best thing by the beef industry in the long run. Because our consumers are gonna watch us. They're gonna watch us like a hawk. The only way we can communicate to them that we're taking responsibility for our part is with data. We have to collect the data. We have to put it in a scientific way and then communicate it in a, in a, in a way that's real to convince them that we're taking responsibility for our part. Because we're emitters. We didn't mean to be. We're not bad people. It's just the facts. It's the science. They're there. And so we can fluff around on the regen stuff. I'm sorry to say that, and it's probably controversial to say it, but it's, it's part of a whole lot of things we have to do. We need to think about it in the context of how long is it going to take for consumers to change their mind in eating our wonderful, wonderful product. Thank you.